Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. Adrian is away. Tonight, unprecedented moves from two provinces to hit back at a second wave and ward off a third. People are just afraid to go out. A surge in cases forces Newfoundland and Labrador to put an election on hold for half the province. It just was not feasible. March break has been delayed in Ontario, but is the benefit worth it? The kids are exhausted. I'm exhausted. All of us are exhausted. And for what? Police cracking down on another pandemic side effect. Here we go. They're setting up. And there they go. Marketplace takes us inside the fight against street racing and stunt driving. And a Canadian artist makes his debut on an iconic children's program. I mean, Sesame Street was is such a cultural staple. This is The National. Well, there are two major concerns in Newfoundland and Labrador tonight. COVID cases are spiking in an unprecedented outbreak, but also it's happening just two days before their provincial election. So now fear of the former is delaying the latter, and the election is being partially postponed. It is evident that COVID has been circulating undetected in our province for some time. So here's the data just for this week alone. You can see it's not looking good. The numbers going in a pretty clear direction. Yesterday was already a record with 53 new confirmed cases. But today, double it, 100 new cases. That surge has created all kinds of election problems. Workers resigning in fear and voters afraid as well. So today, that remarkable move, delaying the election for half the province. Chris O'Neill Yates has the decision and the reaction. Weather was always a concern in this February election, but it's a COVID-19 outbreak that is now wreaking havoc, and that proved too much for election workers. It's very scary, and people are, uh, you know, people are just afraid to go out. Many election workers have resigned out of fear. We have gone from having a full slate of election workers for Saturday down to less than 50%. Today, Chief Electoral Officer Bruce Chalk made the call to postpone in-person voting on the Avalon Peninsula for two weeks. That's 18 of the province's 40 districts. Given the number of people that uh, determined that they wouldn't be able to work, uh, it just was not feasible to run the election in this particular area. Voters outside those districts can still head to the polls Saturday, and everyone will be able to vote by mail. The election scramble is underway as health officials go on the hunt for the virus. Testing is happening on a scale this province has never seen. Through our testing, we are seeing many positive cases who are asymptomatic or who have only mild symptoms. The surge in cases is linked to high school students and sports activities in the Eastern Health Region. And the chief medical officer is concerned it's spreading undetected. If COVID was able to circulate within the metro region without detection, I have concerns that it could very well be happening outside of the St. John's metro area. PC leader Chess Crosby questions why in-person voting can be allowed anywhere in the province. This is uh, an unprecedented, uh, unbelievable situation. He also says a provincial economic recovery report is expected soon, which could affect voters' choices. Liberal leader Andrew Fury called the election but says he isn't responsible for this confusion. I don't think anyone could have predicted uh, this particular scenario. An unprecedented decision with unpredictable consequences. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, St. John's. Okay, so just how unusual is the decision to postpone the election for essentially half the province? For that, we turn to Chief Political Correspondent Rosie Barton. Yeah, Andrew, I mean, this is definitely uncharted territory in terms of elections, whether it be in Newfoundland or across the country. Elections Canada says uh, it has not happened in the case of federal elections in their 100-year existence. No one can really point to it in terms of it happening provincially either, at least not on this kind of scale and not in modern history. There is an ability for this to happen federally as well. I feel like it's important to mention that because there's been a lot of talk about the possibility of an election. And the chief electoral officer can, under the Elections Canada Act, 
act. He can ask for writs to be withdrawn, for an election in a particular district to be delayed. Uh, they would cite issues like natural disasters, flooding, fires, that kind of thing. But, but it hasn't been done. Um, so the ability to call off an election in part of the country and not the rest is certainly there. Uh, the chief electoral officer actually in front of a committee has pointed to these very issues we're seeing in Newfoundland as part of his concerns. It's not COVID per se. It's the fact that poll workers don't show up because they're worried. It's the fact that there are outbreaks at polling stations. Worth noting, though, that there are three other provinces that have successfully held elections during the pandemic, B.C., Saskatchewan and New Brunswick. So in right. many ways, Newfoundland and Labrador just got really unlucky here. OK, uh, we'll see you soon for at issue. Thanks. Yeah, that's right. We'll talk about that, too. And Ontario students and teachers learned today that their March break is being pushed back by a month. As Katie Nicholson explains, the hope is that will help prevent another spike in cases. Okay, good afternoon. Working from home, but twice as hard. Jason Cunin has never needed March break more in his 26 years of teaching. I'm absolutely exhausted. I was running on adrenaline for the first two months of, uh, of this year, uh, and then uh, hit a wall sometime back in November, uh, and um, I've been running on fumes ever since. And now those fumes will have to keep him going a little longer. After the province announced March break now won't happen until April. I recognize that this is one more change in a year that has been challenging for so many students and our education staff who continue to work so hard. But is one made on the best advice of public health officials. Postponing the break could prevent travel for people and the coronavirus. Yeah, what and there's another benefit. It gives us a little bit more time, first of all, to get folks vaccinated, especially those that are high risk. And it allows us to um, ramp up the testing strategies for, especially for the new variants that we're seeing. That may be good for physical health, but teachers are worried about mental health too. I'm infuriated. I'm absolutely infuriated by this. Um, and it's, again, it's not even just for me. The kids are exhausted. I'm exhausted. All of us are exhausted. Teachers unions say it's not like it's members or even students were going to travel this year. They just need a staycation pronto. The Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario has been inundated with complaints of burnout and frustration. I would say to the Minister uh, of Education, uh, go into a classroom, do what our members are doing uh, for an, another month beyond uh, the, the, the schedule where the March break was scheduled. Um, they are hanging on now as it is. Okay, and Katie, this does come at a time when doctors are increasingly worried about variants and a potential third wave. Yeah, the new modeling out today suggests that there is a threat from that variant that was first identified in the UK, which we know to be more contagious. And preliminary data suggests it is more lethal. And, you know, there are fears that that variant could force numbers to soar here in this province, particularly because we are seeing a relaxing of, of some of the restrictions in some areas. And to get a sense of how dire that could be, here's a little exchange from the briefing today. Am I missing something here, or is this presentation actually predicting a disaster? No, I, I don't think you're missing anything. Uh, the cases will likely rise, given the variance of concern. Uh, the need to keep that R down is really, really critical. Now, that R refers to the virus's reproduction rate, which, of course, has never been as low as officials have wanted. So what's the answer? Aggressive vaccination and sticking to all of the public health measures we've been following since the beginning of this pandemic. Andrew? All right. Thanks, Katie. Now, speaking of vaccines, Manitoba is now the first province to place its own order for COVID vaccine doses instead of relying on the federal government to do it. The timing is worth noting. The announcement came just before today's update on Canada's vaccine rollout. Only a little over a million, 1.15 doses, have been administered so far. This means that 2.4% of Canadians have received at least one dose of vaccine and 0.5% have received two doses. Canada's performance does lag behind about three dozen other countries. But Manitoba's deal will not affect its supply anytime soon. Cameron McIntosh shows us why timing is everything. We were working on a COVID-19 vaccine. It's not approved yet. Only halfway through its first clinical trial, it's not even on the government's list of leading vaccine candidates. Still, Manitoba's premier is betting on it. This is insurance. 
And it's important to have insurance, especially... Brian Pallister, openly frustrated with the pace of federal vaccine rollout, committing to buy 2 million doses of an unproven Canadian vaccine. I want Manitobans to get vaccines, and I'd rather they got them sooner rather than later. Calgary's Providence Therapeutics is hoping to have its mRNA vaccine approved by fall. This deal gives it cash to start producing and stockpiling doses this summer while it waits. It's at risk. Manitoba's taken some risk, and we've taken some risk, um, so that we can start the process earlier. Even then, most Canadians may be vaccinated before it's approved. This was the Prime Minister earlier this week. We are still very much on track for tens of millions of doses into the spring, and for everyone who wants to be vaccinated, vaccinated by September. It's likely that we're going to have to vaccinate people every year, depending on the variants. This expert says building domestic production is critical. And Providence holds similar promise to Moderna and Pfizer. It, essentially the same vaccine. We're talking Coke versus Pepsi. Providence, which says it can pre-produce 50 million doses, is openly courting the provinces. It's not off the table for Saskatchewan as well. We need to do our, uh, our homework, make sure it's technically feasible. Look, if the feds deliver all the vaccines that they say they're going to deliver, then this is important for future pandemic responses. The real risk here is in those vaccine trials. If it's not approved, Manitoba loses its deposit. If it is approved, Manitoba is first in line for what could be Canada's first homegrown COVID vaccine. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Now in the United States, President Joe Biden says his administration has now purchased enough vaccine for every American. Just this afternoon, we signed the final contracts for 100 million more Moderna and 100 million more Pfizer vaccines. Biden added that both Moderna and Pfizer have committed to delivering 600 million doses of vaccine by the end of July, more than a month earlier than initially anticipated. Meanwhile, House Democrats rested their case in the impeachment trial of Donald Trump with a final push to connect the dots between Trump and the violent actions of the January 6th rioters. Susan Ormiston shows us how they tried to do that today. Hey, we were invited here! We were invited by the President of the United States! Tying Trump to the rioters one after another, saying he was their commander. If it comes down to war, guess what? I'm gonna be there. Days later, she said she was following Trump's directive. Personally, I do not feel a sense of shame or guilt from my heart from what I was doing. I thought I was following my president. We will stop the steal. Prosecutors today accusing Trump of an unrelenting pattern of violent intent. When a follower he'd invited to the White House said this. The only good Democrat is a dead Democrat. Trump retweeted it. January 6th was not some unexpected radical break from his normal law-abiding and peaceful disposition. This was his state of mind. This was his essential M.O. You're a traitor to your country. Yeah. You're a traitor. They argue he lit the fuse. His loyal foot soldiers pitted against police. Are you an American? Act like the you the So much for back in the blue. Prosecutors argued that white supremacists unleashed by Trump degraded the Capitol and its people. One black officer said, I got called the N-word 15 times today. Trump did this. A black janitor who had to clean up the mess said he felt terrible. When he had to clean up feces that had been smeared on the wall, blood of a rioter who had died, he said, I felt bad. I felt degraded. Prosecutors closed their case imploring senators to convict to protect the country. If we let it go unanswered, Who's to say it won't happen again? Tomorrow, the defense. Trump's lawyer telling Fox News the so-called trial is offensive. It tears the country apart. Do you think it leads to healing, to show and reshow the tragedy that happened here at the Capitol, lives lost, that had nothing whatsoever to do with President Trump, but they want you to believe that it did? Setting the stage to absolve Trump at a Capitol still bearing the scars. Mm. So, Susan, what do we expect from Trump's defense team? Well, the, the Democrats were very selective in that infamous January 6th speech that Trump also said words like patriotically and peacefully to his supporters and that his words aren't uniquely inflammatory. I expect to see examples of Democrats saying things akin to fight like hell. But the Democratic legal team does believe they damaged Trump this week. 
even if a conviction is politically out of reach. Okay, thanks, Susan. Senior correspondent, Susan Ormiston in Washington. Now, here in Canada, Senator Mike Duffy has lost his bid to sue the Senate. He wanted damages related to his suspension following a high-profile investigation of his expenses. The Supreme Court ruled it will not hear Duffy's appeal of a lower court decision that prevented him from suing Parliament's upper chamber. Duffy had been seeking nearly $8 million in damages after the investigation ended with Duffy's acquittal on 31 criminal charges. Well, British Columbia just had its worst ever year for overdose deaths from illicit drugs, many laced with fentanyl. The province's chief coroner is calling on the federal government to help deal with the problem. There is a responsibility to look after people. Where we see 7,000 people in one province alone dying in the last five years due to toxic illicit drug supply. So let's put this in numbers. BC had more than 1,700 illicit drug deaths in 2020. That's a 74% jump over 2019's total. Chief Coroner Lisa Lapointe says overdoses have taken more lives than homicides, suicides, collisions, and prescription drugs combined. Now, while Vancouver, Surrey, and Victoria were the worst hit, other parts of BC are struggling too, like the coastal community of Seashelt. Briar Stewart shows us how. Hey guys, do you need anything? As an outreach worker, Hawk Feather Peterson's car is packed with harm reduction supplies. Okay, can you jam it in your hoodie? Yes, I can. Okay. I overdosed last week. You did? And it took them 60 minutes to revive me. Peterson lives in Seashell, a picturesque community of about 10,000 on BC's Sunshine Coast. While the opioid crisis might not be as visible here as in Vancouver, toxic drugs are still a problem, something Peterson, who is also a user, knows firsthand. I went down and I went down hard. I actually came to and I, the first thing I said to my, my partner was, see, I told you it was fine. And I had no idea he had been giving me naloxone and, and sorry, and how hard it was for him on his side. Last year, the number of overdose calls increased by more than 100% here. There were 87. Every community is having the same issue, no matter the size. Once we recognize that, we need to, we start then looking at what is a solution that we can take on because it is our problem. And there aren't enough services here to help. There's no treatment center. The only option for detox, the local hospital. Advocates want to see more support for some of the most vulnerable. A safe consumption site opened up at the shelter last year, but it's still the only one on the Sunshine Coast, which stretches about 80 kilometers. So to help, some physicians here and elsewhere in BC have started to prescribe safer alternatives to street drugs, and they believe that is having an effect. The fact that we have a fairly low death rate here on the coast attests to the benefits of providing care to this population group. Uh, so I think what we're doing here to a degree is working. But still, there were a few deaths from overdoses here in 2020. Overdose isn't just killing people, it's destroying lives. Which is why Peterson plans to keep reaching out and encouraging people to never use alone. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Seashell, BC. Well, this coming Monday, a Quebec public coroner's inquiry will look into COVID-19 deaths at long-term care homes. Tonight, we go inside the especially hard-hit Heron facility near Montreal. Here's Alison Northcott. It'll be great. Okay. And I hear a lot of good things. Remember? Eileen McDevitt is about to move out of the long-term care home she moved into less than a year ago. Everything's going to be okay. I hope they are right. <laughs> She lived through a devastating COVID-19 outbreak here just weeks after she arrived. Dozens of residents died in a matter of weeks. Ça, la zone rouge. Nurse Maria Nelson showed our Radio Canada uh, colleagues what was once the home's red zone. Ajouté. She came in as backup when things were at their worst and saw residents who were dehydrated or hadn't been fed because there wasn't enough staff. Other workers described residents with overflowing diapers and unchanged bandages. We created a still like a family here. You know, we were like in a war and now the war is, is down and, uh, and now we're moving, we're moving our residents. The once private home now run by the Regional Health Authority is closing permanently next fall. So residents like McDevitt are leaving. You're going to make some new friends there, Eileen. McDevitt's niece and caregiver says things have improved since last spring. I don't know. Uh, what 
she was a witness of. I'm just happy that because of her dementia, she doesn't remember. What happened at Heron has been the subject of a police investigation, and next week, a coroner's inquest begins. I don't know how her last days were. I think of her screaming for me. Barbara Schneider's mother, Mary, died at Heron and says families were kept in the dark for too long. She's part of a proposed class action lawsuit against the home. If I knew what was going on, I would have come in no matter what and taken care of my mother. I had no clue what was going on. She hopes the inquest brings more accountability. You're going to your new place. Oh. As McDevitt heads to a new home, her niece hopes there are lessons learned from the tragedies here that lead to better care for the elderly. Allison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. And there is a growing push to make another vulnerable group a top priority for COVID vaccinations. The virus poses a much greater risk to people with developmental disabilities. Kate Kyle shows us how people in Yellowknife are addressing that. Kelton Broom and his mother Barb cherish memories from a pre-pandemic vacation. When COVID-19 hit, they had to become extra cautious. If I got sick, ooh, my immune system isn't uh, as good as others. Broom has autism. Keeping his bubble small is important, but not easy, because he needs a lot of help from people outside his mother's home. People are dying. It is this just... isn't like, ha ha, funny. It's just like, oh, that care. It's serious. Some of those fears have now eased. Broom recently got his first dose of the Moderna vaccine. He's one of 23 people in Yellowknife who have developmental and intellectual disabilities to get the shot through the group Inclusion NWT. It lobbied the territorial government to make its clients a priority because they can't easily distance from support workers they need. That puts them at a higher risk because they just can't, they can't do without that support. It's a nationwide concern. Inclusion Canada says to date, no region in Canada has made people with developmental and intellectual disabilities who live alone or with family their own high-risk priority group. For example, in people with Down syndrome, four times more likely to contract COVID-19 and over 10 times more likely to die uh, from COVID-19. And if you look, uh, at all the jurisdictions and the vaccine prioritization that you rarely actually see disability mentioned at all. Let's stand up. These days, Kelton Broom feels a bit safer working out with the Special Olympics. But I can't wait to get a second shot. This gives us that little bit of hope. But advocates say many people like Broom in other parts of the country will continue to wait for that hope until more vaccines arrive and people with developmental disabilities become a priority group all on their own. Kate Kyle, CBC News, Yellowknife. Well, much of Western Canada is in the grips of an extreme deep freeze tonight. Next on The National, grappling with frigid temperatures in the midst of a pandemic. It's more important to have the men's side and not perish and take the risk of COVID. Here we go, they're setting up. And there we go. Police tell Marketplace dangerous driving is on the rise, but what happens after the drivers are arrested? And bringing a new voice to an iconic children's TV show. It's such a pleasure to be on the same stage as uh, Big Bird and Elmo. Why Sesame Street came calling this Canadian. We're back in two. Welcome back. Chances are, wherever you live in this country, you'll want to keep those doors and windows closed. It is rough out there. In fact, there are few places in Canada where it's not ice cold. Some 10 million square kilometers plunged below zero at the same time this week. Extreme cold weather alerts are in place from central Canada all the way to the west coast, and this could last for days, including in regions unaccustomed and unequipped to dealing with such brutal conditions. Tanya Fletcher looks at the multiple dangers for British Columbia tonight. That sound is responsible for the coldest air Metro Vancouver has felt in more than a decade. The icy winds outside sparking a flurry of activity inside this homeless shelter in Chilliwack. Female's jacket. It's here the needs are most acute, enough to put pandemic protocols on the back burner. 
we're only supposed to have 12 in our emergency shelter. We've had up to 24 so far. So the way we look at it, it's more important to have them inside and not perish and take the risk of COVID. 10 minutes down the road, the cold weather implications are felt in the fields too. It's entirely possible that we could lose this arugula. On this family farm, it's a scramble to pull these tarps turned blankets over the vegetables on the chilliest morning of the year. As the forecast plummeted this week, they quickly harvested as many carrots, beets and potatoes as possible. Is it frozen? The problem now, it's so cold the veggies will freeze if they're washed and they're due to hit the local farmers markets this weekend. Yeah, suck it up. I mean, it's it is what it is. In a coastal region not well equipped to handle blistering colds, a wind chill of minus 25 is a big deal. It's rare for us to get in the right setup for this kind of extreme cold. We need winds to race through the valleys, carrying that cold air from the interior. These are some of our uh, Cabernet Sauvignon vines. Here. At Quailsgate in Kelowna, ice wine is key to their business. It has to dip to a certain temperature to be able to harvest, but it's now so cold the vines themselves are threatened. We have stopped pruning, and the reason for that is if it does get into that danger zone, which is really kind of in that around minus 20, uh, we start to see that there's a possibility that the buds could be damaged. And it's not over yet. A new storm is brewing off the Pacific, taking direct aim here on the south coast. It's even expected to bring record amounts of snowfall to Victoria this weekend. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. And ahead tonight, fighting a rise in dangerous driving. Look at Oh, he's flying. We are not pursuing. You're going to want to see this. Marketplace gets a front row seat to a growing pandemic problem. But first, Rosie's here with At Issue. Hey, Andrew, tonight we are going to talk about Aaron O'Toole's leadership. I'm Aaron O'Toole. If you don't know me, I'm the leader of Canada's Conservatives. Six months in, is his message reaching Canadians? Plus, should Newfoundland and Labrador's delayed election be a pandemic wake-up call for the idea of a federal election? We'll get to all of that with Chantal, Andrew, and Althea. It has been almost six months since Aaron O'Toole first introduced himself to Canadians as the new leader of the Conservative Party. Good morning. I'm Aaron O'Toole. You're going to be seeing and hearing a lot from me in the coming weeks and months. Now he's making changes to his front bench, shuffling key critic roles and releasing a new ad with a familiar message. I'm Aaron O'Toole. If you don't know me, I'm the leader of Canada's Conservatives. So is that message actually reaching Canadians? What do these changes tell us about the party's election strategy? It's Thursday, and I'm here with that issue. Chantal Hébert, Andrew Coyne, and Althea Raj. I'll admit that some of that gave me some, uh, some flashbacks to the extraordinarily long convention that got him that job. I'd forgotten how long that was. But, but let's, start, mm -hmm. uh, let's start with some of these critic roles changes. I mean, it, it wasn't a huge move, but there were significant ones that, that might be able to tell us something about the direction the party is going in or where they're trying to put their, their focus. Chantal, do you want to start us off? Uh, Pierre Poiliev, namely, losing the finance critic position. Well, uh, a bit more than a week after uh, kicking out of caucus, uh, and that was something that Mr. O'Toole wanted, uh, Derek Sloan, who had quite a bit of support amongst social conservatives, to replace what many conservatives or the person that many conservatives see is uh, one of the most effective persons on that bench from finance to somewhere else. And I know it's not supposed to be a demotion, but let's be serious. In the same week, Mr. O'Toole mm -hmm. said the next election is going to be about the economy and where we would take it from there. And at that point, the finance critic already more important than others uh, becomes the number two person in caucus is either a brave or a very reckless move in the sense that at some point you need to know who in the party uh, is still behind you. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that the Poilievre uh, move and his radio silence since then bodes well for Mr. O'Toole. What, what do you think, Andrew? Does, does, that, does that signal something to you in terms of the way Aaron O'Toole is approaching election strategy? 
Um, maybe. Uh, I think this was uh, more about tone than content. Uh, Pierre Boilievre is very effective. He's very smart. He's very hardworking. He's very effective in terms of pleasing the base. I don't think he's so good at, at appealing to non-committed voters who aren't already in the conservative camp, uh, mostly because of his harsh grating style. He's a very polarizing persona. Uh, and that is not the face of the Conservative Party that they would like to be presenting in the, in the, in the coming election. Uh, and frankly, he has as high or higher a profile at this point than Aaron O'Toole does. Um, so I think from that standpoint, it makes a certain sense. The problem is uh, he also represented a certain degree of content for the party, that he was a, it's well, it's very clear what he stands for and where he is sort of positioned on the ideological spectrum. It's yeah. really not clear at this point where, what Aaron O'Toole stands for or what the party stands for. So it's problematic from that standpoint. And, and you do need, uh, you do sort of need an attack dog a, as a leader. You need someone that will go and do the things that you don't want to be seen doing, Althea. I don't know if you need that person to be your finance critic, though. Um, it depends who you ask uh, within the Conservative Party about what was behind this move. Um, I, I agree a lot of MPs believe what Andrew just articulated, that basically Pierre Poilievre speaks to a, a very partisan base that wants to stick it to Justin Trudeau, and that that is not the message that they're hoping uh, to appeal to women voters with, for example. And in comes Ed Fast, who's somebody from British Columbia, where the Conservatives want to win more seats, uh, who looks like your grandfather and is a very nice person. <laughs> and maybe that will be more attractive to female voters in Ontario. Um, but at the same time, if you're going to take Pierre Poilievre out of the finance position, why are you leaving another attack dog, Michelle Rempel Garner, in the health portfolio? Um, so there are others within uh, the Conservative caucus who believe that maybe this is about leadership politics. And right. Pierre Poilievre, who has a very um, high profile, is bilingual, uh, maybe shuffling him out a little bit uh, of the limelight is a way to go. Um, we know that they, the O'Toole crowd did not want Peter McKay to run again. Uh, maybe this is just his way of uh, solidifying his leadership over the party. Yeah, I will admit I've yes, heard that too. The, yeah, Chantel, yeah. Yes, but at the end of the day, you're the, the, the leader of a shrinking party whose tent is not expanding. It's going the other way, whose base is becoming discouraged. Um, and and the, the, the core issue, going back to that ad about Aaron O'Toole introducing himself again, the problem Aaron O'Toole has at this point is not introducing himself. It's not the ranks of the we don't know who he is that have been growing. It's the ranks of those who are saying we don't like who he is. And I am someone who does share the view that uh, Pierre Poilievre does not sell well outside the base. But uh, yeah. having a grandfather appointed yeah. that makes you want to vote for the Conservative Party, where do we start here? Can I just add that today, Aaron <laughs> yes, yes. actually gave a speech where he said, we are not your grandfather's Conservative Party. So it's interesting. <laughs> I think maybe he meant to say, we're not your father's conservative party, but maybe more like your grandfather's conservative party. <laughs> okay, but uh, Andrew, but, Andrew, where is Aaron O'Toole at, though? And, I, you know, I, Chantal has mentioned this in previous panels in terms of how the pandemic has sort of limited opposition leaders' space uh, during all of this. So how is he doing generally, if you were going to evaluate him right now? Uh, he's all over the map. Look, it, it would be it's always a tough job being opposition leader. It's hard getting, you know, airtime. It's hard getting focus. It's particularly hard in the middle of a pandemic. But he his message has been so uh, confusing and multifaceted. Uh, one day he is talking about how the conservatives are a mainstream, moderate, pragmatic party. The next day he's railing, almost sounding like Donald Trump, against financial elites who have betrayed the country and talking about a Canada first agenda. The next day he sounds almost like a new Democrat. He's talking about, you know, how he wants to co cozy up to unions, et cetera. Uh, he's got to pick a lane. He's got to figure out what his message is going to be uh, and communicate. And I don't think it has to be that complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's not done well, but they're not in terrible shape. They're one point behind the Liberals in the last mm -hmm. poll. So a, a sensible, moderate, pragmatic, conservative party, center-right party, uh, is absolutely poised to take advantage of that. And, and that actually fits naturally with O'Toole's, I think, real persona. Mm. He just doesn't seem to be aware of that himself. Okay, qu quickly, uh, Althea and, and Chantal, on that. Then I want to do a quick round on Newfoundland, so, so quickly. I think one of the problems is we don't actually know who Aaron O'Toole is. You know, if he is, he's not presenting the Aaron O'Toole that he presented a year ago when he ran for the Conservative leadership. Um, so I think it raises questions about um, 
hypocrisy and ethics. You know, he can't, he, he didn't want Derek Sloan to be removed from caucus a year ago. And if it wasn't for Derek Sloan, he actually would not be leader of the Conservative Party. That introducing ad, frankly, should have been done last fall or even in late August after he had won uh, the leadership of the party. And the message seems completely tone deaf. I mean, people are worried about their parents and grandparents dying of COVID. They're worried about their kids getting sick at school, and he wants to get the economy back on track. We're not there yet. Okay, so quickly, Chantal. If I can just say that uh, six months to a federal election, I think uh, panels like this one, including this one, probably buried the leader of the official opposition who then became prime minister, just for context. Yeah, the, <laughs> it's good context. Okay, quick go around on what's happening in Newfoundland and Labrador. Definitely unprecedented. What does it tell us about the likelihood of an election federally or the dangers, I guess, of, of taking this risk, even when you think you've got it all under control, Andrew? Well, I mean, there's two types of risk. There's the pandemic risk, and they're properly taking, pay, paying full attention to that, although I think this idea of only holding the election on Election Day in some of the ridings and not in the others is a bit cockamamie. But I think the more operative risk is where you're at in the polls. The Liberals are ahead by 28 points in the last poll I saw in Newfoundland. Uh, I think that's going to govern Justin Trudeau's calculations much more than the state of the pandemic okay. is. Where is he at in the polls? Althea. Um, I think that the potential that you would have an election that gets completely that goes completely off the rails nationally um, it would be too big a price, I think, for the federal liberals to pay. Um, I think in Newfoundland and Labrador, I mean, it's unfortunate you never want these things to happen, but it's yeah. not unheard of that we vote on different day. I mean, we we vote in advance polls on sometimes weeks apart from E Day. Uh, what is concerning is that there is no end point. So I think that should probably be announced soon because you can't have people believing that there is some polit political calculation going yes, on yes. with the date of the election. Chantal, last word. Uh, running an election campaign is driving a narrative that uh, gets you hopefully to victory. Uh, and the worst thing that can happen to that narrative is a sudden pause, an open-ended pause, I think, it uh, probably beyond the 28 points lead for the Liberals in Newfoundland and Labrador. It should give federal liberal strategists, those who are in the uh, Hawks, uh, let's go in the spring uh, election camp, food for thought. Okay, we'll leave it there. I, I just enjoy that Andrew said cockamamie, and I'm just going to enjoy that all night long. Thank you all very much. Before we go, be sure to subscribe to Ed Issue, the podcast. We've got extra content, including the panel's take on this story this week. I will be seeking the nomination for the Green Party to represent it in the next federal election here in Toronto Centre. That's Anime to Paul, and we'll talk about that strategy on any major podcast app and on our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. Okay, Rosie, and looking ahead to this Sunday, what can we expect on Rosemary Barton Live? Well, starting on Monday, if you are entering Canada through the land border, you will have to show up with a negative COVID test. So we're going to talk about the complications of that for some people and uh, why the government has decided to go that route. We're also going to talk more about variants and how concerned many people are about how that will contribute to the spread. Excellent. Okay, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Next, a rise in stunt driving and speeding on all those empty streets. See and hear what we did as Marketplace gets a ride along right after the break. COVID has changed a lot in our lives, including on the roads. The CBC Marketplace checked in with police forces across the country who say in some places, speeding and stunt driving is surging. And as David Common shows us, the consequences can be deadly. York Regional Police are on the prowl. Here we go, they're setting up. And there they go. Hovering high over our roads, and during COVID, there's been a sharp rise in stunt driving charges here. In many Canadian cities, police tell us they've seen a huge surge in risky behavior. There too, uh, they know we're here, they're all starting to scatter. It's basically opened the streets up for people that are into this racing culture. For Peel Police Sergeant Scott Hogan, street racers are a real problem. No stopping at all. These two guys here. And when cops move in to shut it down. Look at he's trying to get away. Look at. 
Oh, he's flying. We are not pursuing. But it's not just stunt driving. Speeding is also up in York Region. So what happens to risky and careless drivers, especially those who injure and kill? Most people would be surprised. They walk away with a small fine. Patrick Brown has represented car crash victims for 20 years, including the family of a mom of three kids killed walking her dog. And the driver? She got a $1,000 fine. This is in front of a public school. Another crash, killing a little girl. A $1,000 fine and a six-month prohibition on driving. The message we send out is, hey, if you want to kill someone with your car, don't worry, not much is going to happen. Brown is now calling for tougher consequences, perhaps even forcing drivers who kill or injure to retrain and prove they can be trusted. David Common, CBC News, Markham, Ontario. And you can watch more of the Marketplace investigation into risky driving and the call for more consequences Friday at 8 on CBC Television or you can stream it on CBC Jeff. Okay, next, a $1.5 million experiment that hopes to flip the odds working against black high school students. If someone has been told that they don't belong for so long, we're now coming in and saying, no, you do belong, you can do better. And the work's already begun. We'll show you how it's going. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, why one MP wants profitable companies that didn't need the government wage subsidy to pay at least some of it back. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Black students can face real roadblocks when it comes to school. Studies have shown they have lower graduation rates, for example. But Natalie Collada takes us up close to a pilot project in Ontario designed to change that. The teacher asked her, what are you doing in this classroom, right? To say that you don't belong in an enriched classroom. And these are the conversations that we're having daily with black students. Keisha Evans works at two Toronto high schools with black students from grade nine through 12 and beyond as what's being called a graduation coach. It's not just, hey, we're going to get you to graduation, but successfully get you to graduation. With more confidence, feeling more empowered to take on the challenges that the world is coming at you with. A 2017 York University study said black high school students in Toronto drop out at higher rates and are less likely to apply for post-secondary education. Black students continue not to be disengaged, not not really uh, graduating in their high numbers as their peers. And therefore, I think it's an attempt to address that problem. The Ontario government provided more than $1.5 million in funding for the project, which started early last year. Evan says she's already seeing change in the students she's mentoring. You'd be surprised at how many students reached out and said, I need the support. I'm, I'm so happy that you're here. For grade 12 student Sophia Liendo, the program has helped turn her dream of becoming a pediatric surgeon into a plan. Having someone uh, in a position of power who is not only black, but also a black woman has, you know, opened my eyes to the possibilities for me again, like things that I can do. It's no longer impossible in my mind. And that, says Evans, is exactly the point. If someone has been told that they don't belong for so long, we're now coming in and saying, no, you do belong, you can do better. By all accounts, a successful program that's scheduled to end in June. Natalie Collada, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, next on The National, a Toronto poet gets a big debut. The story behind how his short film got on Sesame Street. The letter C. C is for counting. Well, this short film released today on the iconic kids show Sesame Street. The creator behind the film is Toronto-based poet Ian Keteku. Now, years ago, Ian pitched an idea to Sesame Street but was turned down. But perseverance paid off, and tonight, his work in their episode is our moment. 
is out. It's a perfect day to garden. Today is uh, the premiere of the episode, so my short film comes in the middle of that episode. Sesame Street was is such a cultural staple in the lives of so many kids around the world. Let's count them. The piece is all about counting. It's a, a young girl. I call her Nyameche, which is uh, my mother's middle name. And her and her mother are planting carrots. Carrots from the carrot seeds. A, a big goal of mine is to show uh, unrepresented, particularly African faces and voices in children's media. Carrots from my family. So I was mentioning how persistence pays off. It was a few years ago at the Toronto International Film Festival that Ian pitched his idea to Sesame Street. As I mentioned, they turned it down, but obviously he made an impression. They remembered his work, called him back, he pitched a different idea, and that's the one that flew. That's The National for this February 11th. Have a good night.